Take your Bible, turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter uh, number 9, if you would. Isaiah chapter 9. If you're a little cool or something this morning, you may just want to come over and sit on this side. Uh, the sun's pretty bright over here. Or you could come stand right here, actually. And uh, I think you'll be okay. But Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah 9, very special passage of Scripture here, often quoted this time of year. It's a passage that I'm sure you're very familiar with. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it, and with, ju excuse me, with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Some 700 years before Jesus is born, here is God, the Spirit, speaking through a man by the name of Isaiah, and he's talking about none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the child that is born. Jesus is the son that is given. Jesus is the one who will carry the government upon his shoulders. He is the one who will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the one who will sit and rule and reign on the throne of David forever and ever. He's the one, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus Christ is the one. This is long awaited, right? Many promises, been talked about over and over and over, but kings have come and gone, and none of them have ruled forever, save Jesus. And here he is. He has showed up. The child that is born, the son that is given. Special emphasis upon given. God was not obligated to do what he did. But because of his love for creation, he knew that the only way to fix our situation was to come to us. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that he did. I'm grateful that he humbled himself, that he came, that he was like us, and that he tasted death for all of us. The son was given that you and I might know peace. The son was given that you and I might know peace. Today I want to talk to you about Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And I want to talk to you about the peace that he gives us. And I want to talk to you from two different facets. But the son was given that you and I might know peace. But I want you to understand at the outset that peace is not some sort of feeling that we are trying to search for and find in life. I want you to understand from the outset that peace is and will always be a person. And that person is Jesus, who is known in the passage that we just read as the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. A prince is a ruler one of noble birth and high position, but he is the ruler of peace. Jesus is rest. He is security. Thus I, through faith in him, get to enjoy this kind of life. I get to enjoy the kind of life where I can be at peace. In other words, that I can be at rest, that I can be in a secure place. But understand, that's not something that we search for, that we attempt to attain. It's something that we receive when we receive the Prince of Peace. A child is born, a son is given, the Prince of Peace, so that you and I might know peace. According to Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says that the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation to all men. The grace of God appeared. That's interesting. The grace of God appeared. What is it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. And Paul's saying that one day grace, which is Jesus, showed up and appeared to bring salvation. The word salvation means deliverance. 
We know that it's a deliverance from the penalty and the power of sin and one day from the presence of it. But one of the things that Jesus came, that grace showed up to deliver you from was a life of fear and insecurity. He showed up to deliver you from having to live a life the opposite of peace. So peace, ladies and gentlemen, is the result of God's presence. So it is the result of receiving and not earning. See, peace wants to live in you that you might experience peace in two different ways, and that's what we're going to talk about. Peace wants to live in you so that you can experience, number one, peace with God. And then number two, peace wants to live in you so that you can experience the peace of God. Okay? So what's the difference? Peace with God, the peace of God. Well, let's, first of all, let's talk a little bit about peace with God. Peace with God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. One of my favorite texts. Listen to what it says. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, by, by faith, we have, church, you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To kind of understand this idea of peace with God, I'm able to gain greater insight when I look into the idea of, of reconciliation and understand reconciliation. Now, first of all, I want to define what reconciliation means, okay? Reconciliation means the establishment of friendly relations between parties who are at disagreement with each other after making peace or, or make, or excuse me, let me go back. Establishment of friendly relations between parties who are at disagreement with each other making peace after an engagement in war. It is also the restoration of favor of one after rebellion against that person. See, reconciliation provides me with a good understanding of what all, what all it means to have peace with God. Let me ask you a question. Why do people not have peace with God? Why is it that some people in this world, when they talk about God and when they talk about a relationship with God, they don't have peace. They're not at rest. They're not secure. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. They're insecure. They're constantly living in doubt and frustration. Why do people not have peace with God? Well, I can only, in a sense, look back at my own life and think about those times when I didn't have rest, when I wasn't secure. And I look back at those times and I think, you know what? The whole time I was the one trying to fix it. I mean, you had these two things, God and myself at odds with each other, or at least that's what I'm thinking. And so I'm living my life in such a way where I'm trying to fix that relationship. But here's the problem with Matt Rummage. He's trying to fix something, and in the process, guess what? He keeps messing up. I mean, I'm trying to fix it, but my goodness, every time I turn around, I, I'm just royally blowing it. Anybody relate with that? It's just the thing. So if you're trying to fix it, and if you yourself are trying to reconcile and bring yourself together with God and create peace with God, then listen to me, you'll never have it. You can't experience it because here's the thing. When you're trying to fix it, you're always going to mess up. We're all the same in that aspect. We live with the mentality. A lot of people, just like I was, we live with the mentality that God is always disappointed. 
that God is always mad at us because we're not performing like we think we should. But here's the cool truth this morning. Reconciliation is a finished work. And my, what a glorious day that was in my life to understand that. Not only understand it, but to embrace it. That reconciliation is a finished work. Remember, it is the establishment of friendly relations between parties who are at disagreement with each other, making peace after an engagement in war. Do you realize that apart from Christ, that you're at enmity with God, the Bible says, that you're at literal war with God? Because you're dead and you can't help but pursue everything that is really opposed to God and his plan of salvation through grace, through faith, by grace, through faith. But what I want you to understand today, today is that reconciliation is a finished work. It is a done deal. You say, well, what are you basing that on, Pastor? Well, turn over a book or two books to 2 Corinthians 5. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 with me. Let's read uh, verse 17. You know this one. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So if you're in Christ today, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has, listen, who has reconciled us to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Excuse me, I skipped one. Verse, back to verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. You notice that? What Paul's trying to help the church understand is that this idea of reconciliation, this idea of making peace with God is a done deal. You need to embrace it. I want you to embrace it because now I want to turn you out to the world as an ambassador for Christ. And listen, you're never going to turn out to the world and be an ambassador for Christ as long as you're thinking that somehow you're the one who has to earn your peace with God. Because if you think you're the one that's got to earn your peace with God, who's the one you're thinking about all the time? So Paul's reminding the church, look guys, this is a done deal. Because you'll note in the text there, look at verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. I mean, I want you to think about this morning. God has already reconciled the entire world to himself. He's already done it. So you say, well, pastor, does that mean everybody's saved? No. Because who are the only ones that are going to enjoy that truth and reality in their lives? The ones who receive it. You see, the war has already been fought. The battle has already been won. Peace has been made between sinful man and holy God. So all that's left up to you and I is to receive the relationship that Jesus gave his life for you to enjoy. Make sense? Right? So now turn out to the world. Now go flip the world upside down. Why not? Now then, you are ambassadors for Christ. And here's how God did it. Let's finish with verse 21. I read this verse a lot. But look how God did it. Look how he did it. For he, that is the Father, made him, that is the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In him. In him. In Christ, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God took what we deserved And he put it in Jesus. God took all the judgment you deserved. And he put it in Jesus. He put all the death you deserved. He put it in Jesus. And Jesus went to Calvary and he fought that battle and he won it. And he destroyed the power of the enemy. He did. Amen. 
said, well, where are you going with all this, preacher? I don't know. But here's the thing. There are way too many people, and it may not be you, and it's okay. But there are way too many people out in the world trying to fight and earn what is freely given. And so they live their lives with no peace, no rest, no security. Because they're trying to do what's already been done. Is that, do you, you get that? It's like here I am trying to bring some peace between me and God. And God's just kind of whispering to you like, hey buddy, <laughs> I already done this. Would you please stop? Would you just receive so I can turn you out to this world and use you to proclaim the good news of what I have done so that they too might receive peace with God. The Prince of Peace showed up so that you, so that I, so that the entire world could experience peace with God. See, you're never going to experience peace with God until you realize peace is not something you earn but something you receive. Now that one you can take. Now, now remember, you got to understand your pastor un understands something, the bigger picture more clearly than I ever have. You know, I say these things, I repeat these things, and I say these things over and over and over again, so hopefully, God willing, they will be embedded in your mind. And here's why I do it. Because I just know every day in your life, God is crossing your paths with people. And ladies and gentlemen, you need to be ready. You need to be ready and willing and able to tell them the truth. Because I'm going to tell you, the world is trying to fight and earn what God wants to freely give them. So my job is to raise up an army. To raise up an army, a gospel army of those who are equipped, not laying a burden on them. It's not a burden. The work's finished. You're not going out as an ambassador to earn anything. You're going out as an ambassador because you've been given everything. So really, I realize that what I'm saying to you is really not for you. That's why I try to challenge you all the time about taking notes because, man, if you realize it's not about you, then, man, you've got to make an effort to capture it. I mean, if you realize you're not just showing up at church for you, man, you're showing up at church for the world so that you can be ready for the world, that you're prepared for the world so that when they show up and they're struggling to get peace, you can tell them, hey, that fight's already been fought. It's not something you earn. It's just something you receive. So when you get Jesus, guess what? You get peace. You get rest. You get security. Listen, I'm telling you right now, 110%. You're looking at a man who is at complete rest, who is completely secure in his salvation and relationship with the Lord. I do not doubt that. You know why I don't doubt it? Because I'm basing it on his performance and not mine. And because I'm standing on the promises and not my own goodness or my own performance. You can have that too if you receive it. There's a cool story. I'm not going to get in depth with it this morning. You can go home and read it. But it's really interesting. In Mark chapter 5, there's the woman with the issue of blood. I just kind of noticed it as I was studying the idea of peace out through the scriptures. Now here's this woman with this issue of blood. She has spent her whole life she spent all her money, spent tons of times trying to get people to fix her. Well, one day she convinces herself that as Jesus passes by, if she could just touch, literally, the hem of his garment, that she could be made well. Now, there's a whole lot of truth in that whole idea of the hem of Jesus' garment, but we won't go there. You can study it out yourself. But here's the cool thing. She's convinced herself if she just touches the hem of the garment, she's going to be healed. And guess what happens? She gets through that crowd, and she touches it. And immediately, ladies and gentlemen, she's healed. Immediately. Jesus did in a moment what no person, no amount of money had ever been able to do in her life. And what is so cool about this is what Jesus says to her. The very first word that comes out of his mouth to that, because remember, he asked the question, who touched me? Well, he knew who touched him, right? But he's trying to highlight who this is because he has something to say to her because he knows how most people are. And the Bible says that when she comes out of the crowd to him, it literally says she's full of fear and she's trembling. 
And here's why she's full of fear and trembling, because she thinks she's reached out and gotten a hold of something that she's not worthy of. She's thinking, "Uh uh-oh, I have messed up. But Jesus says, "Where, where you at? Who touched me? The very first word that comes out of his mouth is the word daughter. That's how he addresses her. (laughs) He addresses her as daughter, and he says, your faith has made you whole. And then here's what he says, go in peace. Go in peace. You see, that is the desire of the God who created you. He is not some God that is sitting around somewhere looking at you, loving you, accepting you, blessing you based on how well you can do it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank God he is blessing us on the basis of how well Jesus did it. So you want to get rid of your fear, you want to get rid of your your insecurities, then receive what Jesus has to offer you. And it is peace with God. Take it. Take it. Stop believing the lie that you have something to do with it other than receiving it. Well, last of all is the peace of God. Let's look at two quick passages. So the Prince of Peace, man, the Son of God is given. The Prince of Peace comes so that you can enjoy peace with God, but also that you can enjoy the peace of God. Now, this is so cool, guys. This is, this is something that has literally set me free, changed my life, no doubt. Philippians chapter 4. Is that where we are? Did I tell you Philippians 4? Look at Philippians 4. You know these verses as well, but I promise you today you'll probably never look at them again the same. Philippians 4 verse 6. Listen, be anxious for nothing. You know what that means? Let me put it down in in the redneck vernacular that I understand. It means don't worry about anything. Are you serious, God? Don't worry about anything? Because here's what I'm thinking. I just got a phone call last week from a friend of mine from my other church. The pastor there, Brian Hager, whom I know well, he lived in the community. I knew him before I left there. He took over for me after I left. And so Brian, who has a two, three, and a four-year-old, every one of them babies are miracle babies. Every one of them, because they were told they would never have kids. Brian just found out this past week he's got Lou Gehrig's disease. He was told he's got two to five years. He's 40 years old. You mean to tell me, God, you're saying not to worry about that? You mean, God, I'm not supposed to be a little bit anxious? About the fact that they're telling me I might not have but two to five years to live. I got three youngins. And what do you think? You think think God's big enough to handle that situation? The Bible says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And listen to this. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? So he says, don't worry about anything, but when he calls us to pray, and when he calls us to let these these concerns, let these anxieties, let these requests be made known to God, what he's doing is, He's saying this, he's reminding them of of the reality that through what Jesus has done, a door has been opened. Constant access has been given to the son or the daughter to at any time come into the presence of the king of kings and let their requests be made known to him. Right? So think about this. The invitation is this. What are you worried about? What are you worried about? Is it bigger than God? Really? So then the invitation is, give it to him. Give it to him. You know what the difference will be? You being a person at rest 
versus a person who's not at rest. A person who is secure versus a person who's insecure. Colossians 3.15. Next book over to the right. Listen to it. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, you, you can go back and look at the context. I'm not trying to rip it out, but basically at this point in Colossians chapter 3, Paul is kind of throwing some things out. They are connected, but the way he throws these things out, they were intended to be like statements that you would kind of pull out and think about and meditate upon. And so he's saying, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Here's some things that I want you to hear through these verses, and I'm, and I'm done, okay? Here's what I want you to hear. Again, I'm just a review. When you receive Jesus Christ, hear me. When you receive Jesus, listen, you have the peace of God. Okay, so if you receive Jesus, then you have the peace of God. So here's the thing. Remember, you got the Prince of Peace indwelling you, right? So now he's made the promise that he would never leave us nor forsake us. So when at any time is peace going to ever leave you? When? Never. Tell yourself that. Peace will never leave me. You know why? Because Jesus is never going to leave you. Prince of Peace is never going to leave you. When you take him, guess what? He's coming to stay. He doesn't treat your heart like a hotel, right? He doesn't check in one minute and the next minute he's gone. No, he comes in. He comes in to stay. So you have it. You see, a lot of times when I have talked about peace in my, in, my, in my past or when I hear others talking about peace, it's almost as if it's something that we're trying to get God to give us. Right? I mean, don't we often pray, hey, God, give me peace about the situation. And you know what I believe God's saying? I've already given you my peace. What's the problem? You already got it. You already have it. So a lot of, of us get way too busy trying to find peace or searching for peace instead of jo enjoying and using the peace we already have. I hope that makes sense. Because I, I hope I set you free from never, ever having to pray again, God, give me peace. Because if you do, if you say, God, give me peace, I'm telling you based on the authority of God's word that you're asking for something you've already got. Because you've got Jesus living inside of you. So how does this work? How can we use peace every day in our lives? Well, number one, you got to admit you have it. And as Paul says right there in the text in chapter 3, verse 15 of Colossians, he says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The word rule is a very unique word. It's the word that means umpire. What does an umpire do? An umpire decides in the games in the Roman world, the umpire was the one who would declare this one to be the winner or that one to be the loser or this one to have cheated or this one to have committed a foul or whatever. The umpire would be the one to decide. So what is Paul saying? Let the peace of God decide in your hearts. So here's the deal. You have God's peace. And you will always experience that peace as long as you're living out Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Does that make sense? Because what are you doing in Philippians 4? Don't worry about it. What are you doing with it? You're laying at the feet of Jesus. You're saying, Lord, I'm not going to waste my time trying to fix it. Lord, I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure it out. And you know what he says? The peace of God that you already have is going to guard your hearts and it will guard your minds through it. Does that make any sense? So here's the thing. You're living life every day. You're living it. And man, there's just this restlessness, this insecurity, this lack of peace in your life. And you're a believer and you're sitting there and you're going like, what is wrong? I'm telling you 100% of the time what you will find. If you look around at what you're doing, you're either trying to fix it, trying to figure it out, and handle it all in your own strength. And so what God has given you his peace to do is to serve as an alarm clock. 
So when you're not experiencing what you already have, it's God saying, hey, stop. Bring that thing to me. Cast it on me. Stop trying to carry it. Can anybody in this room relate? Somebody just say an amen or an oh me or a glory hallelujah or something, y'all. Come on, man. This is real life. This will set you free, guys. I'm telling you, man, because all our lives we're saying, hey, God, I'm about to make a decision. Will you please give me peace? Where does it, God, God, you already got it. And if you're not experiencing it, then you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to fix it. You're trying to do it all in your strength. Best thing to do is let me handle it. I'm telling you, you're looking at a new guy, man. I mean, I know I won't walk it out perfectly, but I am at more peace in my life today than I have ever been ever before. There are things that used to bother me that absolutely don't bother me anymore. I get frustrated like a lot of people, absolutely. But I can tell you this, I don't stay there as long as I used to. I can tell you that. And that's a part of the growth experience is you're just not there as long as you used to be because you begin to realize what's going on. I'm trying to figure it out, Lord. So you have it. Let it rule. Let it decide. Let it be what alarms you to the fact that you're trusting or not trusting. That's how peace works. So let it decide. I close with this challenge, Second Peter, real quick. Just one verse I'm going to read. Don't panic. Everybody says, oh, Lord, he's getting ready to preach another message. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. This is what it says. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how did he say that peace could be multiplied in your life? It's not a sense of your peace necessarily getting more of it as it is it being multiplied and experiencing more of the reality of it. How's it going to happen? Does it say by trying harder? Does it say by, I want to multiply a piece of my life? No, it just says it's found in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. So you know what I challenge you with today? If you know him, continue to pursue the opportunity to get to know him. And understand how powerful and how awesome the knowledge of God and Jesus really is. You know why he finished the work? He did the reconciliation. He made the peace. So that you could just simply have the opportunity to get to know him. Are you enjoying that? Or are you too busy trying to make it all work in your own strength? You're too busy trying to live under a law that you were never intended to, to be able to keep. It's not why God gave it. My challenge to you that if you believe, if you have the Prince of Peace, continue to seek Him, continue to know Him. And let me just tell you something as we close. When you are resting, when there is a reality of peace in your life and you're walking in faith with Him and you're just, you're just learning to give it to Him, I'm going to tell you something. Others will be impacted and this is really what it's all about. That's really what it's all about. They see it. They can tell whether or not you're a person at peace. And your life begins to serve as a great imp uh, as an advertisement for the goodness and the grace of God. And it opens doors for our mission to be accomplished. Do you have the Prince of Peace living in you? Guys, you know how I am. I'm not going to make this any more difficult than it really is. You say, I'm not sure, preacher. Well, here's the reality. You want him living in you? Guess what? You got to receive him. It's not a thing of you coming down here crying, cutting cartwheels everywhere, letting me lead you some sort of magical prayer. I'm telling you, it's just as simple as you asking him in. And realizing, you know, I can't earn this. God, I can't earn peace. I've got to receive what Christ has already done. It's a gift for you to be enjoyed. It's a gift that, don't miss this part, it's a gift that will change you forever. 
It'll change you from the inside out. It's interesting that this is a time of year when we're giving gifts and receiving gifts and just enjoying some fun time with family. It's fun. I enjoy it. But amidst all that's going on, listen, guys, don't you dare miss the greatest gift of all. Don't you miss the opportunity to experience a peace that surpasses all worldly understanding. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for your invitation into life, into peace. So, Lord, I trust you. You, you clarify. You do what you got to do, Lord. You know the ones that are unsettled. You know the ones that are insecure in their relationship with you. You know the ones that have yet to really embrace their assignment because they can't get over their own doubt and their own confusion. So God, we continue to give it. We continue to scatter the seeds upon the soil of men's hearts. And we just, we go to sleep because the rest is up to you. So Father, thank you for the privilege that you've given us to share the gospel with the world, the gospel of peace. So, Father, now just use it in a mighty way. May your people embrace their assignment to the world, and may we be who you say we are, and that is ambassadors for Christ, those in whom you are using to declare to others that reconciliation is a done deal. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray.